yes. So when he says writing about the things we do and matter to us, that immersion in English culture, not about taking Ventura Highway, because we don't do that. See you in your next life. <laughs> When you finally know what you're doing, you kind of move into this phase, where it, what's called the imperial phase, where literally everything you do is kind of gold dust. If you've gone through your life not really being anything, and then people t telling you you're the savior of the music industry, it does affect you. Boring. I felt like there was a platform and that we could use the platform then. And we could to a certain extent, although we couldn't use it anywhere near as much as I thought we could. <laughs> I just thought we could do what the fuck we wanted. Swade was always a balance in power, which was almost like a nuclear reactor. It could go wrong at any moment, but it didn't. It just stayed in this stasis until it went wrong and then it blew up. One of the problems that Bernard had is that when everything was about the music, then he was kind of the leader. I'm Wendy and I run the phone. Once you're out in the world, a band isn't just about the music. And then immediately Brett becomes the focal point. And, you know, I think Bernard had a problem with that. And I don't think it's necessarily a problem with Brett. I think it's a problem with the musical aspect of the band being diminished. The press, the adulation, and the things that bands need to do, like photo sessions and make videos, which he didn't find particularly creative or, or of interest. He became quite disillusioned quite early on with our relationship with success. If there's differences between you, it'll pull at those differences and magnify them. We went on an American tour just after Bernard's dad had died. I mean, I look back on it now and it, it was, it was insane. If it were to happen now, I wouldn't want to be around a, a bunch of people partying all the time. You know, there's something about touring that it's a bit like being on holiday. Bernard eventually started traveling with the Cranberries on the tour bus, um, which was a pretty big sign that something was going on. We started, I think, having our arguments through music. We would never sit down and talk about things. It's difficult to know how to, how to deal with these things when you're young men. You, don't, you just don't have the tools, the emotional tools to deal with these things. That's when most of these things do happen, you know. Very few people go out there, pick up a guitar, age 52. Normally it's when you're 18, <laughs> 19. Dangerous, very dangerous. Bernard was obviously unhappy, and that tour went very badly, I think, for the band. By the time we made Stay Together, it was obvious things really weren't the same as they were on the first album. The mood of the band was very, very different. And then you get to stay together. It's basically a battle between Brett and Bernard. And the most vital part of the song is the bit at the end where Brett's vocals are buried under this kind of this squall of guitars and you can't really tell what's going on. And there's a kind of incoherence to it that we'd never had before. The relationship between Brett and Bernard was definitely changing, was getting more fraught. That obviously we had to get round to pushing them to make the second album. When it came to writing Top Man Star, we'd write much more separately. We kind of communicated by post. Everything that we became defined by in the first record drove me up the wall. I wanted it to destroy it. I was writing stuff 
at home. And I just recorded endlessly, endlessly, day in, day out, and then took him round to his place in Highgate. So I'd give him a four trap with like eight pieces on it or something, and a few days later he'd have overdubbed vocals and then I got it back. Yeah, it was a very strange way of working. You know, we, we, we wrote by post and, and then we recorded kind of separately. The whole period of making Dogman Style was very, very, very prickly. It was plain. There was a lot of tension in the room. And it just stayed like that. I don't ever remember being in the studio in Master Up all together, possibly once or twice. It was almost like, almost like shift work going on. Shift pattern was basically Bernard didn't want to be in the studio with anybody else. <laughs> he tolerated me because I was still required to operate the equipment. Ed, he's a musical producer. You know, he was with us from the first single and kind of grew with us and was very much part of the band. He was almost one of us. You feel like you're part of a family. He's kind of like, he's the, he's the stable dad to your errant sons. I think there was at some stage, Bernard was asking Ed to sort of teach him how to produce a record. Bernard was immediately at home in the studio and wanted to learn everything. Every dial that was turned, every lever that was pulled. My memory of Bernard is getting on with him really, really well until it all went wrong. He'd had a rough year, his dad had died which was just as brutal as it can get. And he was just dreadfully, dreadfully unhappy. And I think the pressure of having to deliver this record that everybody was waiting for, plus his awakening realization that being a guitar player in this fantastic band wasn't what he thought it was going to be. There were other components that he wasn't comfortable dealing with. The song, The Two of Us, it was very much, I think, a song about mine and Bernard's relationship. Superficially, it's a song about two successful brokers or something like that working in the city, making loads of money, but being quite lonely within that relationship. But the kind of subtext of that is that, I think, it's about loneliness within success. I'll trade my eggshells and hoping that it would go away, you know, and I hope it would sort itself out. But no, it just sort of got worse and worse and worse. I must admit I was pretty blind to to quite how bad things were. It was no problem to me if Bernard was like, okay, this chord moves this way, blah, blah, blah. Whereas when he started telling Simon what to do, Simon was kind of like, I'm the drummer, I know, I know what I'm doing. It was a situation where we were rehearsing, I think we were doing New Generation. It was a, a roll at the end of it.
And Bernard was adamant that it shouldn't go there, it should go somewhere else. And I was adamant that it should go here. I mean, he said, do your job.